Hello, and welcome to the new 5-minute guide on the Douglas TBD Devastator. Uh, because it is like 93 degrees outside, I do have the AC on in the background, so I apologize for that background noise, but without further ado, let us begin. So, in the 1920s, America's naval aircraft were all exclusively biplanes, as dictated by the weight limitations and design restrictions that came with making carrier-launched aircraft. When America was looking to modernize its naval air arm in the 1930s, with newer technologies now available to it, it began a design competition for new bombers, which attracted the submission of aircraft from Brewster, Douglas, Vought, and even Northrop. The XTBD-1 from Douglas would win the competition alongside Vought's SB-2U Vindicator and the Northrop BT-1, which would later become Douglas's SBD Dauntless. First flown in 1935, the XTBD-1 proved very promising thanks to a list of technical features and impressive performance, which would convince the Navy to adopt the aircraft as its new carrier-borne level bomber and torpedo bomber. With official introduction in 1937 and the designation TBD-1, next named Torpecker by its crews and then later Devastator, it would become the U.S. Navy's first monowing carrier-borne aircraft, as well as the first naval plane with a fully enclosed cockpit the first naval plane with hydraulically powered folding wings, and the first naval plane to use an all-metal construction. As designed, the Devastator could reach a top speed of 206 miles per hour at a cruising altitude of 8,000 feet, with a maximum takeoff weight of just over 10,000 pounds, a feat only capable due to its Pratt & Whitney Twin Wasp engine that delivered 900 horsepower. For payload as a level bomber and torpedo bomber, the Devastator could mount a variety of general-purpose demolition bombs, as well as the infamously unreliable Mark 13 torpedo. All of these performance figures painted the Devastator to be a fairly capable and reasonably effective aircraft, with 130 examples being ordered and built from the course of 1937 to 1939. But why only two years of production? Well. Despite its admirable performance figures for 1937, the U.S. Navy was not dumb and was aware that these figures would quickly become outclassed by newer aircraft and rendered suboptimal by improved technology. Indeed, by 1939, the plane was already out of date, and designs for its successor, the TBF Avenger, were already in the works. But then, Pearl Harbor was bombed. With the U.S. now dragged into the largest war ever seen in human history, it was up to the Devastator to hold the line as Navy's premier level bomber and torpedo bomber until it could pass the torch to the Avenger. Early in the Pacific Front, the Devastator held its own, scoring successful raids from the carrier's enterprise in Yorktown against previously held U.S. islands, now occupied by the Japanese, and even achieving a strategic victory by the skin of their teeth at the Battle of the Coral Sea helping sink the Japanese carrier Shoho, and stopping the naval invasion of Port Moresby. It was here that the infamously unreliable Mark 13 torpedo began to show its design faults, which have already been covered in great detail by Drakenefell. Unfortunately for Devastator crews, these issues would not be solved before Midway. At Midway, 41 Devastators were sent up from Hornet, Enterprise, and the newly repaired Yorktown fresh from the Battle of the Coral Sea to strike the Japanese fleet before it could reply in kind. It was an uncoordinated mess. With no fighter cover to keep Zeros off their backs, they descended low and slow to line up their torpedo runs, and watched as friends caught fire and slammed into the unforgiving waters of the Pacific. Those that did manage to get their torpedoes away would score no hits, as their torpedoes were either dodged, ran off course, or malfunctioned. Out of the fleet of 41 planes, four made it back to Enterprise, with two landing on Yorktown. None returned to Hornet. Their sacrifice, however, was not in vain, for it was their attack that brought the fighter cover from the Japanese carriers down low, just in time for the late-arriving SBD Dauntlesses to score a victory that changed the war in America's favor. But that account is best left for the Dauntlesses episode. Following Midway, all Devastators were recalled from active service to be replaced by the TBF Avenger as it began to roll out fleet-wide. Their public reputation would be forever tarnished by this, with some calling it the worst plane ever built. However, this is not a fair assessment, for it was not the Devastators' faults exclusively that led to its downfall. Granted, the plane was out of date, but its usage and tactics were the key to its downfall, shared alongside the failings of the Mark 13 torpedo. Going in with no fighter cover was the major mistake. With no Wildcats to back up their attack, the Zeros had free reign on the Devastators. 
Add to that the intrinsic risk of the torpedo run having to fly low, slow, and level to get off a proper release, or else risk breaking the torpedo, it's no wonder their losses were so heavy. These issues with doctrine and tactics, compounded with the faults of the Mark 13 torpedo, would even plague the Avenger as it transferred into the role of the Devastator once held. It was only later in the fall of 1943 when these issues were finally ironed out that the Avenger would score victories in its intended role. With no need for the Devastator, meanwhile, the remaining stock would be scrapped, and none would be preserved for posterity's sake. A replica made for the movie Midway from 2019 was donated to the USS Midway after the film and can be seen today, but all original examples still lay silently at the bottom of the Pacific. <laughs>